Welcome to Arts Express. This is Prairie Miller and on the show. on by the solar winds. They adapt and they survive. The function of all life is survival. Sleep, 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 sleep. The seed is planted. Sleep, sleep. Terror grows. Sleep. Matthew! Matthew! Like the others. Wake up! Get you when you sleep! Sit up! It's got no detail, no character. It's unformed. All of a sudden, they're growing like parasites. Is it contagious? People are being duplicated. How do you know my name? I didn't tell you my name. I can't find anything in here that looks like a body. My side's nosebleed. It looked right at me. You're looking at it as if it was human. It was not human. Now. The classic fear begins to grow. <laughs> We're being cornered. They're barricading the street. Get down. Invasion of the body snatchers. The seed is planted. Terror grows. The sci-fi horror classic Invasion of the Body Snatchers may have had its roots in the anti-Russian Red Scare here over 65 years ago, but its homegrown paranoia is still very much alive today, and at the moment in the official suppression of any opinions not in lockstep with U.S. policy against the designated other. And coming up on Arts Express is a look at several recent body and mind invasions and snatchers of property, political and otherwise, so stay tuned. But first, Mia Frampton, the daughter of classic rock legend, songwriter, and humble pie soloist performer as well, Peter Frampton, is a young musician and actress in her own right, and a star of the coming-of-age dramatic feature, Coast, just out in release, which, however fictional, in many ways mirrors her own life growing up, Surrounded by her father's rock culture as an impressionable youth, here are some scenes from Coast as vulnerable youth in a small California town are mesmerized by a nomadic rock group just passing through. I'm Dave. Abby. Abby. Saw you. Your performer. What the hell are you doing in this town? If you don't take chances in this life, you're already dead. Where did you meet her? We could really use someone like you on stage with us. There's nothing else like it. Lips better than sex. Lips upon my eyes. You know he's leaving, Abby. Lips. Come on tour with us. Yeah. Lips upon my face. You call me problem child, but I ain't got no problems I can see. You weep, you moan, you don't change anything. I'll deal how I want to deal. Why don't you live how you want to live? Yeah. Abby, you know you're amazing. Yeah, I know. And Coast is a coming-of-age story, but much more as well, as Mr. Sosa, the high school teacher of these unfocused youth, played by Eduardo Roman, struggles to get them in touch with the buried history that's all around them, but not a part of any school curriculum. 
first some of those scenes in Coast, then Mia Frampton. He doesn't talk about it much, but for a long time, my grandfather worked strawberry fields. Okay, Kathleen, take your time. My grandfather worked the strawberry fields. Even sat there at night. All to save money to bring my abuela and my mom to the U.S. Now we try to pay back his sacrifices by working hard and doing our part to contribute to our town and the community. They do not know my name, but they will know of my hard work. And this, beautiful people, is what the great Cesar Chavez fought so hard for. Our workers are an integral part of how our great country runs. Kathleen, beautiful and fascinating family history. Thank you. And why do we tell our stories and learn about history? Because those who forget the past are condemned to relive it. Yes. Another round, have a seat. What are we doing at a church? I have asked your wonderful classmate, Laura Nakashima, to read part of her paper here. Laura? Fine. In 1945, this church became the home of displaced Japanese Americans after being released from camps during the war. This church gave them shelter and food. A number of families were forced to live here since everything they owned was taken away from them. One of those families was my grandfather's. Isn't that just fascinating? <laughs> Way too excited about this. And why do we tell our stories and learn about history? Because those who forget the past are condemned to live. Yes. <laughs> uh, could we uh, walk around? Yes, please. Respectfully, people. You never told us that your families were in the camp. Why should I have to tell you your parents grew up here too? Everybody's stupid parents grew up in this town. Whatever. Why don't you understand? I know my parents, my life is just some joke to you. Your parents worked that farm? So our families actually worked the same farm then. Yeah, cool. Still mad at you though. Okay, everyone, this way, please, this way. Come on, you're gonna love this story. <laughs> The local mission sponsored a rescue operation to save the Southern Channel Islands' remaining Native American population. Although, did we know they wanted to be rescued? During the rescue, a storm arose, and realizing the imminent danger, the ship left, leaving one person, a young Juana Maria, behind. It took 18 years and several expeditions back to the island to try and find her. Eventually, they were successful in bringing her to the mainland, Sad part is, she died from illness seven weeks later. But that's just one version of the story. <laughs> oh, man, I love this. Some say she actually boarded the first ship. And realizing her child had been left behind, dove overboard. She swam back to the island knowing she would be left behind. Amazing, isn't it? A mother willing to give up everything for her child. And who doesn't love romantic stories, huh? <laughs> Hi, it's Mia Frampton. Hi, and welcome to our show. Thank you. <laughs> what was it about Coast that drew you to this film and this story? Well, um, I have been a part of the project um, for almost 10 years. So over that um, span of time, it's been different things that have drawn me to it. But... Um, at its core, it's kind of a story that <clears throat> I think that any young woman could identify with, um, meaning that it's, you know, when you're growing up, you feel like uh, you can feel like you don't belong, you don't know where you will belong. Um, and, you know, she kind of finds Abby, the main, main character, finds herself through music. And that's another part that I defi definitely identified with. And um, as uh, you know, throughout my life, I've been um, into different parts, different types of music, and, um, you know, it can sort of relate back to what part of my life that was, and it can remind me of a certain time, and 
Um, and with this movie, it's more of the punk rock scene. So, um, you know, it was just a story I could identify with. And um, uh, I love the how music plays into the film as well. And your character, Christy, is somewhat of a mystery. So how would you describe her in your own words? And without giving too much away, how she ends up as the somewhat designated villain. Yes. Um, you know, at, at the, uh, the basis, I guess you could say she's maybe a little bit mean, but I, I think she's sarcastic and snarky and um, she's multi-layered. She has uh, a story and has um, a secret kind of that um, no one else knows about and um, she tries to play it off. Um, you know, she acts like she has all the confidence in the world and you know, that might not actually be the case. Um, So, yeah. Now, one thing that does stand out about your character, Christy, is her one great line, when a man with a rifle threatens to shoot you because you're on his land, and you shout back, tell that to the Indians. What can you say about that? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, she's right. (laughs) Uh, We've just taken over, and it was not really ours to take. So, I mean, I'm really proud of um, of Chrissy and that line because it's true. And, um, I mean, I don't think most 16-year-old girls would mm-hmm. know something like that or say something like that mm-hmm. so um, brazenly. But, yeah, I agree, and I, I love she's speaking the truth. And related to that, What stands out about this film that is more than just a coming-of-age story is its multicultural cast and delving into that history of diversity in the community. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, I'm so proud to be a part of a project that is indicative of, you know, our world and how we have multi, we're multicultural and we have people from all walks of life. And that's what I love about living in California. It's, You know, almost everyone here is transplants, so um, you get to meet people from all walks of life. And um, I'm just so happy that, you know, um, as a woman, we're getting these stories made, more stories that are um, just, like I said, multi-layered. And um, women are finally getting to explore different characters and um, different stories than we've previously been able to. And is there anything else coming up for you? Um, you know, right now, I mean, I, I've always said I, I want to be, uh, I don't want to be a jack of all trades, master of none. So right now I'm more focusing on acting, but my dream definitely would be to have a role that um, encompasses both. So um, I don't know if that would be a musical or something of the sort, but, um, yeah, I mean, one day, who knows, I'll, I'll definitely get more into music, but right now I'm just focusing on the acting, you know, right now I'm working on my own projects and, um, I'm discovering that I do like to write and, um, I also like behind the camera as well. So yeah, I, I got a taste of it, um, because I was an associate producer on this film. So I'm also, um, seeing what it's like behind the camera as well. And what about your mother, Christina Elfers? What has it meant to you in your life, or not, that she's a former Playboy bunny? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, she, Yeah, so, I mean, she's beautiful inside and out. Um, she is just the coolest woman in the world, and I know I'm biased, but um, she's smart and funny, and I that's definitely where I... I get my quick wit and um, dry humor from. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, she um, is definitely what I hope to be, multi-layered and woman, and that's what makes us women beautiful is all the different parts of us. And any last word on Coast? Please go see it. It was. (laughs) a passion project and it's available on video on demand amazon all the places you can find movies um it's a little bit of a romance as well so i know i enjoy those 
Um, and I'm just so happy to be here and talk on its behalf. Now, though you're not the main character in Coast, you did experience that music world and music culture through your father. So did you identify with the character in any way in that regard and discover it of that world? Um, yes. So definitely. I mean, I, gr- I grew up with um, music in the house and, um, you know, my, my dad going on tour and all of that. Um, I mean, it's... It, you like I said, you you find your identity sometimes through music, mm-hmm. and like Abby, she's like she's at an age where um, music is, is everything to you at that age. You think it's life and death. You you know you'd follow a band if you got the opportunity to. So um, I, I I definitely identify um, with her. I I, I remember just, you know, all the CDs that I <laughs> burned with um, just all the music. And, you know, I remember my sister had one of those, those huge CD books that attached to the mm-hmm. top of the car. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> that was like when I first, so it was a, it was a little bit of a different experience for me. But um, yeah, I definitely relate to Abby, of course. And would you say your father and the coming of age now classic rock music that defined his rise to prominence has influenced your own music? Yeah. I mean, who who can say it? It, it doesn't, you know. I mean, that was really the golden age of music. Um, I mean, most bands these days, I think, you know, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s are still our biggest influence. Um, maybe the 80s, maybe not so much, but, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean... It's, I, I think imitation is the highest form of flattery. So, um, and classic rock is, uh, we have a lot to thank for all of those um, pioneers of that time. So I, I definitely, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mia Frampton, for calling into the show. Thank you so much. Bye.
next on Arts Express. It's going to get much worse. Whoever controls the narrative controls the world. They have stolen something sacred from us. Political analyst, journalist, poet, songwriter, and self-described digital street philosopher and recurring commentator on this show, Caitlin Johnstone, with an invasion of the body snatcher new mind control mechanism just implemented by Homeland Security, the Disinformation Governing Board, or rather a name that it's become more widely known as, in protest, the Ministry of Truth. What is yet another censorship entity, this time from the government rather than big tech or independent journalists, all of whom they intend to oversee as yet another layer in the one-side-to-every-story U.S. political narrative. And who exactly is this giddy, seemingly harmless, designated head of the new Ministry of Truth, Nina Yankowicz, who in contrast arrives on the scene with a background in CIA think tank operations like the National Democratic Institute and a position at the anti-Russian Foreign Ministry of Ukraine. Here to delve beyond her flaky facade in a recent TikTok performance, and what's really going on with this disinformation governing board is John Stone's deep dive analysis presented by Tom Foley. Wandering is really quite ferocious. It's when a huckster takes some lies and makes them sound precocious by saying them in Congress or a mainstream outlet. So disinformation's origins are slightly less atrocious. It's how you hide a little, hide a little lie. It's how you hide a little, hide a little lie. It's how you hide a little, hide a little lie. When Rudy Giuliani shared that intel from Ukraine, or when TikTok influencers say COVID can cause pain, they're laundering disinfo, and we really should take note and not support their lies with our wallet, voice, or vote. Oh. Oh God, it's going to get so much worse. Rightists have spent the last couple of days freaking out and invoking Orwell's 1984 in response to something their political enemies are doing in America. And for once, it's for a pretty good reason. The Department of Homeland Security has secretly set up a disinformation governance board, only informing the public about its plans for the institution after it had already been established. The disinformation board, which critics have understandably been calling a ministry of truth, purportedly exists to fight disinformation coming out of Russia, as well as misleading messages about the U.S.-Mexico border. We may be certain that the emphasis in the board's establishment has been on the Russia angle, however. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, in her patented You're such a crazy idiot for questioning me about the White House manner, dismissed alarmed questions about what specific functions this strange new DHS entity was going to be performing and what its authority would look like. It sounds like the objective of the board is to prevent disinformation and misinformation from traveling around the country in a range of communities, Saki said. I'm not sure who opposes that effort. The answer to the question of who opposes that effort is, of course, anyone with functioning gray matter between their ears. No government entity has any business appointing itself the authority to sort information from disinformation on behalf of the public, because government entities are not impartial and omniscient deities who can be entrusted to serve the public as objective arbiters of absolute reality they would with absolute certainty wind up drawing distinctions between information, misinformation, and disinformation in whatever way serves their interests, regardless of what's true, exactly as any authoritarian regime would do. This important point has gotten a bit lost in the shuffle due to the utterly hypnotic ridiculousness of the person who has been appointed to run the Disinformation Governance Board. Nina Yankovic a carefully groomed swamp creature who has worked in Kiev as a communications advisor to the Ukrainian government as part of a Fulbright scholarship, is being widely criticized by pundits and social media users for her virulent Russiagating and for whatever the hell this is. And it's this weird Mary Poppins song about disinformation that she posted on Twitter. Because of this person's embarrassing cartoonishness, a lot more commentary lately has been going into discussing the fact that the Department of Homeland Security's Ministry of Truth is run by a kooky liberal, 
than the fact that the Department of Homeland Security has a Ministry of Truth. Which is really to miss the forest for the trees, in my opinion. Would it really be any better if the Disinformation Governance Board was run by a chill dude you wouldn't mind having a beer with? Especially when we know the ideological leanings of this department are going to bounce back and forth between elections, and will always act in service of U.S. Empire narrative control regardless of who is in office? I don't think so. We should probably talk more about how, as soon as people accepted that it was fine for government, media, and Silicon Valley institutions to work together to censor misinformation and rally public support around an official narrative about a virus, the ruling power establishment immediately took that as license to do that with a war and a foreign government as well. Like, immediately, immediately. Now we're seeing increasingly brazen censorship of political dissent about a war that could easily end up getting us all killed in a nuclear holocaust, and a portion of the Biden administration's whopping $33 billion Ukraine package is going toward funding independent media, read war propaganda. We should probably talk more about this. We should probably talk more about how insane it is that all mainstream Western institutions immediately accepted it as a given that World War II levels of censorship and propaganda must be implemented over a faraway war that our governments are not even officially a part of. It started as soon as Russia invaded Ukraine without any public discussion whatsoever. Like the groundwork had already been laid and everyone had already agreed that that's what would happen. The public had no say in whether we want to be propagandized and censored to help the U.S. win some weird kind of info war to ensure its continued unipolar domination of the planet. It just happened. No reason was given to the public as to why this must occur, and there was no public debate as to whether it should. This was by design because propaganda only works when you don't know it's happening to you. The choice was made for us that information is too important to be left in the hands of the public. It became set in stone that we are to be a propaganda-based society rather than a truth-based society. No discussion was offered, and no debate was allowed. And as bad as it is, it's on track to get much, much worse. They're already setting up disinformation regulation in the government which presides over Silicon Valley. The proxy war between the U.S. and Ukraine is escalating by the day, and aggressions are ramping up against China over both the Solomon Islands and Taiwan. If you think imperial narrative management is intense now, wait until the U.S. empire's struggle to control global hegemony really gets going. Do you consent to this? It's something you kind of have to take a position on, because its implications have a direct effect on our lives as individuals and on our trajectory as a society. How much are we willing to sacrifice to help the U.S. win an info war against Russia? The question of whether we should abandon all hope of ever becoming a truth-based society and committing instead to winning propaganda wars for a globe-spanning empire is perhaps the most consequential decision we've ever had to make as a species, which is why we weren't given a choice. It's just been foisted upon us. Whoever controls the narrative controls the world. By taking our control of information out of our hands without asking our permission, and determining for us that we are to be a propaganda-based civilization for the foreseeable future, they have stolen something sacred from us, something they had no right to take. Nothing about the state of the world tells us that the people who run things are doing a good job. Nothing about our current situation suggests they should be given more control rather than having control taken away from them and given to the people. We are going in exactly the wrong direction. Oh, information laundering is really quite ferocious. It's when a huckster takes some lies and makes them sound precocious by saying them in Congress or a mainstream outlet so yes, Information's origin seems likely less atrocious. <laughs> Woo. And you can find more of John Stone's work, as always, at Daily Writings about the End of Illusions, Shadow Band Online, no surprise there, at CaitlinJohnstone.com. And now on Arts Express.
Hi, this is Jack Shalom. Some people seek immortality through fame, but others want physical body forever immortality. A new book, The Price of Immortality, explores the numerous paths that people have sought to extend their lives and the hucksters and scam artists who have taken advantage of them. I'm very happy to have as my guest the author of The Price of Immortality, Peter Ward. Hi, Peter. Hi, Jack. Fantastic to be here with you on the show. Thank you. What is an immortalist and how did the modern idea of this come about? Yeah, so an immortalist is a person who believes that they can live forever. They do a lot of different things to try and make that happen. They Essentially, they believe that we'll reach a point around 30 years from now where technology will enable them to live an extra 20 or 30 years. And then within those extra 20 or 30 years, more technology will come around, which will allow them to live, say, another 50 or 100 years. And, and that will keep happening until eventually they reach a point where they can decide when they want to die rather than it just happen. So immortalists have been around for quite a while. Um, there's been various different versions of them throughout humanity, I guess. The difference, I think, now is that the science is reaching a point where there's some genuine hope for these people. And, and some of the things don't sound so crazy as they did maybe 20 or 30 years ago. So it's an exciting time to be an immortalist, but also I think quite a dangerous time in that there's, there's more scams and, and, and frauds out there than ever before. There are a number of strategies that immortalists have been and are pursuing currently. Could you give us a brief overview of the immortality strategies and then we'll go into them in more detail? Absolutely. The first one I think that they have sort of tucked away in their back pocket is is the plan B, which is cryonics. And and that is is sort of the insurance policy. So if if these if anything goes wrong, if they die, then cryonics is a thing that they believe will bring them back to life, the reanimation. And what so, is so cryonics? Have, uh so cryonics is essentially when you you freeze a body straight after the person dies uh, and you keep it frozen and preserved. Uh, in the hope that it will be reanimated in the future. Uh -huh. In terms of things that they can do now, a lot of it's based around sort of really incremental, tiny things that can possibly extend their life even by you know a few days, a few weeks, months, or years. So they pay very close attention to their diets. A lot of them are on uh, do intermittent fasting. Even further into, uh, down the rabbit hole, you get to sort of stem cell therapies, gene therapies, and so some things which are really uh, drastic medical interventions, but um, still very much fringe science. You started talking about cryonics. Somehow, I guess because I've seen the idea in so many, you know, B movies, I sort of got the sense that this was an ancient kind of thing, but it, it really wasn't. Can you talk a little bit about the beginning of the cryonics movement and how it took off? The the first person to be frozen was a, a man called um, called James Bedford, and a TV repairman called Bob Nelson uh, froze him. Uh, Bob Nelson was a, a really interesting character. His his stepfather who who raised him was a uh, was a Boston mafia uh, gangster who was uh, who was shot in the back of the head. So he had a pretty tough upbringing. He went to LA and he he hurt. He got his hands on on this book called. Um, uh, by Robert Ettinger, The Prospect of, of Immortality. And he read this book and he heard a radio program advertising a, a get-together of people who were interested in cryonics who had read the book. So he went in there and he thought it would be full of people in you know, white lab coats, doctors, um, really intelligent people. So he went there as a sort of humble TV repairman. And by the second meeting, he'd been elected the leader of the group. <laughs> um, so he was plunged into this because everybody it. wants a TV repairman as the head of their cryonics group. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so Bob Nelson became this sort of front man for for cryonics in California, and then when he he had the chance to to freeze uh, this guy James Bedford, uh, he went for it and he did it. And it was it apparently it was a very rudimentary procedure, but he so he was the first man that uh, first person to be frozen who they think there was a chance could be reanimated. Well, um, it, 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 it sounds like he was maybe good at repairing TVs, but the, the whole 
the whole description in the book about trying to freeze people, it turned out to be something like out of the Keystone Cops with Nelson. He, it seems he had no idea what he was doing. Yeah, it's it's fair to say he was quickly out of his depth. Uh, he not only did he 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 was really making it up as he goes along in terms of the sort of science and technology of it. He was also not very good with the accounts, um, so he didn't realize how much it would cost to sort of for the upkeep of these um, frozen people. So there, there are sort of costs in terms of like getting liquid nitrogen delivered. You have to top up the liquid nitrogen every few weeks. Um, you have to have a place to store the people because you can't just keep a dead body in in your in in your house or or anywhere else. Um, Although he did, didn't he, for a while. But yeah, James Bedford ended up at, at someone's house, and, and the uh, one of the people that was involved in the in the actual freezing, and then uh, his wife found out and, and yelled at him. Apparently, <laughs> uh, so woke the whole street up and told him she'd call the police if if he didn't uh, if he didn't take the body away. So yeah, eventually Bob Nelson came on a solution where he he bought a, a spot a plot in a in a cemetery in California, a crypt. And so he began putting the the bodies in there in cylinders, and yeah, it gets quite gruesome. They, they he ran out of space, so he started cramming bodies into cylinders when they wouldn't really fit. He did everything he could to keep these uh, these people frozen, and then he ran out of money, um, and essentially uh, just had to let them decompose. And and the yeah. other thing is that maybe uh, most people don't realize at first glance, if you don't do the freezing right away the brain cells die and nothing is going to bring dead brain cells back. And it's very important that they do it right away. Um, yeah. So that led to a whole series of miscalculations, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So the, yeah, the, um, the understanding is that you, ha- you really have to get it done ASAP uh, uh, after the person dies. So, there were some in the early days where uh, there was one member of, of Nelson's Chronic Society and she unfortunately passed away and she had a card on her body that said instructions of what to do to get her to a Chronic's person. Um, and they called, so someone found this uh, this card and they called the number on it. Um, but the guy on the other end, who, who wasn't Bob Nelson, someone else in a different Chronic facility, uh, uh, Society, um, thought it was a hoax call because they were, they called collect. So um, he refused the call. <laughs> oh, um, no. And this poor old lady was, was sort of left unfrozen. And and then at one point they, they figured, well, let's just decapitate the head and save that, right? We'll leave it to science to restore the rest of the body robotically. But But that didn't go so well either, did it? Yeah, so there was a famous incident in, in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, uh, again in, in California, um, where a patient uh, was decapitated and there was confusion over whether there was a uh, a doctor present at the time that she died before they decapitated her because she'd been brought into the facility before she died. And that caused an, a, a massive uh, media frenzy um, because the coroner's office went after this chronics company, Alcor. They handed over the body but said, we're going to keep hold of the head. The coroner wanted it to do a post-mortem on the head. So um, they hid the head. Uh, the police raided the facility. They got really angry that the head had gone missing. Um, so this poor Dora Kent was her name, this uh, over 80 years old. Her head was sort of been being uh, carted around California um, and hidden. Um, and and eventually the, the uh, Alcor managed to um, get a constitutional lawyer and uh, got uh, successfully got a restraining order um, against the coroner's office, and and they actually won that case. So it was the first I, I think of... you said he never revealed where the head was hidden. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize to any listeners who are offended by my laughing, but it's it, uh, such a gruesome kind of situation. I mean, maybe we should be broadcasting this during Halloween or something, but it is so <laughs> ludicrous. Well. Let's move off from cryonics for for a while. There are some more sensible schemes involving real scientific investigation, 
on the cellular level about how many times can cells divide, how long can they live, is there a way to uh, slow down that process, and so on. And and it's not just charlatans involved now. Some heavy hitter entrepreneurs, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the founders of Google, um, who probably know something about investment, have set up a very secretive company called Calico. Tell us about that. Yeah, so the the, the science of aging has has improved drastically. It's advanced so much in the in the past sort of decade or so, and and so off the back of this sort of knowledge, there has been some uh, some very wealthy people in some Silicon Valley billionaires have started putting money into these companies which are researching aging, and and the 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 most well funded of all of them was Calico, and it was sort of one of these moonshot projects of, of mm. Google. Uh, and there were some grandiose statements made at the start saying we're going to cure aging and, and people were sort of painting them as as this company which was going to stop death, um, which I don't think has ever been the sort of goal of the scientists within it. Um, mm. So the idea is if you could treat aging rather than each individual disease which comes up because we're old, then, then you could have a, a much bigger impact than if you, for example, cured cancer. So there's that research and that sort of a lot of that is around health span. The idea is that we want to make people as healthy for as long as possible without necessarily making them live longer. Um, a lot of people in the field believe that there's a, there's a maximum age for humanity. Um, so our bodies are essentially coded to die. And when we reach 115, 120, something's going to get us at that point, no matter what we do. Hmm. Who is the oldest human being to have lived? So the oldest person um, who is claimed to have to have lived is, uh, is, is Jeanne Calmont, a French woman um, who supposedly lived until the age of 122, and, and she died in 1997. Uh, but there is some uh, doubt over whether she actually did live that long. Uh, it's a really interesting story. Um, but after she died, somebody dug out some research to suggest that, that Jean Comont wasn't actually that old when she died. And in fact, she had died much, much earlier, but her daughter, to avoid an inheritance tax, had <laughs> taken on her, her identity, which is why she appeared to live until she was 122. And people disputed that, particularly people in, in the town where she was born. Um, they said that she was so unpleasant and... And, and unliked in the in the village where she lived, that there's no way that anybody would ever have kept that secret on her behalf. <laughs> so, so it's still disputed whether she was she did actually live to 122. It all basically comes down to the genes. Um, a lot of these people have these strange stories where they say, you know, I, I smoked my whole life a cheeseburger a day, which kind of proves, in a way, that there's not very much you can do. That our our longevity is written in our genes. And, and we can do very little to change that, either to bring it down or to take it up, and that somehow it's already encoded in us. Yeah. Let's talk about another path to immortality. Now that we're in the digital age, we have proposals for digital immortality. What exactly is that? Yeah, digital immortality is the idea that we can somehow upload our brains or create a virtual version of ourselves uh, and that version would be able to live forever. Um, and if we could, if we could upload our brains, then we could have some form of our consciousness living in a virtual world. Um, so it brings up a lot of philosophical questions about yeah. about uh, the self and uh, and what makes you the person that you are. Um, and well, even even from a practical point of view, the, the formatting and retrieval of any such data. I mean, I can no longer access my master's thesis that I wrote on WordPerfect 5.1 that I have on three and a half inch floppy disks. And that was like 30 years ago only. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's um, it's really difficult to imagine it being doing. And the technology is not there to even scan the brain properly and, and get, uh, we can't even reverse engineer the brain. So so it's, it's way off. You you mentioned at the very top of the interview this idea that some immortalists feel if they can just make it through the next 30 years, there'll be some medical interventions that might give them another 50 years. And in that 50 years, there'll be another medical 
intervention and so on, so that they'll eventually achieve immortality. And you call that idea in the book escape velocity. But why even bother if basically after 2050 then, we'll know whether that's happened or not. We'll, every Everyone will have reached that point. Now, unfortunately, maybe those of us who don't have another 30 years won't make it, but that basically means that every single person on the planet after 30 years will not have to worry about dying. <laughs> so what do we do with all these people? Where do they live? What do they eat? Yeah. How do they fit in the movie theaters? Yeah. It's a really great question, and it, and it brings up so many practical issues from sort of yeah overpopulation to to where we if we'd have enough resources. I think the jump that a lot of immortalists make is that along with this technology, there will become this sort of utopia as well. So all of the technologies will will be advanced to the point where you know we have plentiful resources, we can go out into space and, and go to other planets and live there. So that will solve the overpopulation. Um, or, or is the assumption that it's not going to apply to everyone, that, hey, you know, if you got the money, you can do it. And this is uh, America. Given wealth inequality, this is just something that, you know, Jeff Bezos and some rich people will be able to afford. And the rest of us are just going to die anyway. And, you know, so there'll still be plenty of room. Yeah, I think that's the real concern here. If this were to happen, who would have access to it? And if you see the sort of, if you see the access to to healthcare technologies right now, I mean, in America, if you've got the money, then you and you can, then you can get cured of, of something. Um, it's a really desperate system, and I don't think that's going to change just because we figure out um, that we can live longer. So it's um, it's a real concern. You could potentially have a two tier society. Um, if we don't already have it now where, you know, the, the, the very wealthy could live forever and, and uh, live for as long as they want and have all these advantages in, in health. Um, and, and then the poor people would just be left to die. Did this experience with uh, taking a deep dive into studying immortality and therefore death also affect you at all? It was certainly a strange time to be doing this research. It was uh, I started before the pandemic, but a lot of the research went on during the pandemic when we were obviously surrounded by death on all sides. I think it, I sort of went on a sort of journey of um, when you talk to some of the immortalists and you look into the research and science, it's very easy to get carried away and you want to believe them and you think, okay, um, maybe. Um, and then you sort of talk to the gerontologists and they say, no, this is nonsense. Um, and this is, you know, this idea is just not helping us at all. This idea of immortality, we need to just focus on on health span, not lifespan. And it kind of brings you back down to earth again. Uh, I think the con one of the conclusions I came to in the book was that suffering is a lot worse than death. The one thing we should really focus our efforts on is to end suffering in the world. But I think if we can if we can address disease and, and inequality and 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 stop killing each other for a moment, then, then maybe we would, at the end of it, have a world that, that is actually worth living forever in. Well, thank you, Peter. I've been speaking with Peter Ward, the author of a fascinating new book, The Price of Immortality, published by Melville House. This is Jack Shalom for Arts Express with host Prairie Miller. And we'll go out now with a message from your Commander-in-Chief. We'll enhance our underlying effort to accommodate the Russian oligarchs uh, and make sure we take their, take their, their ill-begotten gains.
<laughs> We're going to accommodate them. <laughs> We're going to seize their yachts, their luxury homes, and other ill-begotten gains of Putin's kleptocracy. Uh, yeah. Kleptocracy and klep the guys who are the kleptocracies. <laughs> but these are bad guys. Okay, let's back up here a little. Beyond the weird glee expressed by President Biden about stealing personal property from citizens of a country he doesn't happen to like, and no matter what he or anyone may feel personally about Russian oligarchs, there is something called the Federal Hate Crime Law, the 1968 Shepard Bird Act, which states in part that, it's, quote, a crime to use or threaten to use force to willfully interfere with any person because of race, color, religion, or national origin, which has since been invoked to protect African Americans against racism, and not to mention that shameful World War II legacy when the U.S. government seized the property of Japanese Americans and threw them into concentration camps based on their race. And a move by Biden decidedly weird, and against the advice of the ACLU, as a violation of due process. And that's all we have time for today on Arts Express, Expression in the Arts. And if you'd like to express yourself too, you can write to us at theradiogoddess at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Prairie Miller leaving the station.